So we're looking today at Ephesians 6, uh, verses 10 to 24. And let me ask you a question. It's a question that um, Ben already asked us at the start of the service. Do you feel strong? Do you feel strong? I only maybe occasionally feel strong, and the occasions when I feel strong, I'll give you a few examples. Number one, it's when Lottie is trying to open jam jars. Now, that is a time when I feel incredibly strong because she brings me the jam jar, and of course she's loosened it, but I do then do the ultimate finishing off of opening the jam jar. I also feel strong when I'm carrying suitcases. I often carry two suitcases, and that is a time when I feel very strong. Or maybe, when I ask you, do you feel strong, you don't think about being physically strong. Instead, maybe you think, yeah, I'm pretty strong in myself. I'm no pushover. I'm self-disciplined. I can make it. And so maybe, when you hear the first word, uh, the first little bit of today's passage, verse 10, let's just have a look at that. Oh, I think I've got it. There you go. Finally, be strong. Maybe you think, yes, I'm up for that. Maybe you think, yes, I can do that. Or maybe, finally be strong, that scares you a bit. Maybe you think to yourself, I can't possibly be strong. I feel so weak. Life is already so hard. I already struggle so much. I need help. Well, if you're either of those two types of people, if you feel those, or maybe if you're somewhere in between and you feel both of those things sometimes, like I do, then these words from Ephesians are precious to us. And they're also crucially important to us. Because we've spent the last few chapters of Ephesians looking at what it looks like for the Ephesians and for us to be in Christ and to stay united as his people And now Paul is signing off his letter and saying, if you want to carry on as his people, you need to be strong. Because now, now that you are in Christ, you are in the middle of a war zone. So first point to take home today, first point, don't be fooled, we are at war. Don't be fooled, we are at war. You might not feel like you're at war, but the picture that's painted in the second half of chapter 6 of Ephesians is very, very clear. We are at war, and we're at war against an extremely dangerous and powerful enemy. Now, do you see there in uh, verse 11 who our enemy is? We are to stand against the devil's schemes. And if we're tempted to think that the devil isn't powerful, if our enemy isn't powerful, then keep reading. We are to stand against the devil's schemes um, and also against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul is really stressing his point here. He's saying the enemy is the devil and he is very, very powerful. And he's also very, very cunning. We are to stand against, verse 11, the devil's schemes. Do you see it there in verse 11? We are to stand against the devil's schemes. He schemes. He makes secret plans. And when it comes to war, which we're in, when it comes to war, what does a secret plan look like? Well, it looks like an ambush. Watch out. Be strong, Paul says, because he lies in wait to catch us off guard when we're not expecting it. He lies in wait, ready to ambush us. We are at war against a powerful and cunning enemy. But what is his goal? What is the point of this war? Well, he wants one thing in this war. If God's aim is to unite us together under Christ, well, our enemy's goal is to separate us, separate us from each other, separate us from God. And elsewhere in the Bible, we see that 
The way that he does this, the way that our enemy does this, is by lying to us. His lies led Adam and Eve away from God in the garden at the very beginning, and his lies still seek to lead us away from him now. Maybe it's the lie that looking after number one is the most important thing. Or maybe it's the lie that we should look after our career more than we serve God. Or maybe it's the lie that the things that God has made, the good things that God has made for us, are better than the God who made them. Or maybe he says, surely God didn't mean that. Or surely God can't forgive you. Or anything, anything to point our hearts in the wrong direction, anything to point our hearts away from God. And the consequences, as we know, are deadly serious. He wants to separate us from God forever, to eternity without him, and will do anything he can do to do that. Now, don't be fooled, we are at war. And that sounds a bit bleak. Maybe that sounds scary. Maybe you feel very weak. Maybe you don't feel like you're strong enough for this. And verse 10 says, be strong. And you say, oh, I'm trying, but I can't do it. I feel like God has left me on my own here. I need God to give me some help here. Well, point number one is don't be fooled. We are at war. Point number two, stand firm in God's armour. Now, Captain James Phillipson died in June 2006 in Helmand province, Afghanistan, when he was rescuing ambushed colleagues. And the Ministry of Defence admitted he lacked mission essential equipment. And the coroner, who was carrying out a review into his death, said they were defeated not by the terrorists, but by the lack of basic equipment. To send soldiers into a combat zone without basic equipment is unforgivable, inexcusable, and a breach of trust between the soldiers and those who govern them. And do you feel like you've been thrust into a war zone, unprepared and unequipped? Do you feel like God has asked you to live a life for him, but hasn't given you the equipment to do it? Is this an accusation we can point at God? Well, we'll see. We'll see in chapter 6 that God has given us everything that we need to be in the battle. Now, the first, uh, the first and biggest encouragement should come to us in verse 10. Be strong, it says... But notice, not in ourselves, as Ben was saying earlier, not in ourselves, be strong instead in the Lord and his mighty power. And so if you feel weak, know that he is strong. If the enemy looks strong, know that he is stronger. The creator of heaven and earth, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the great I am is on your side. There is no greater encouragement than this. You're not standing in your own strength. You are standing in his. You are not strong enough, but he absolutely is strong enough. And he has given you all that you need. Verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God. Haven't got that. Um, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. That's what it says in verse 13. Put on God's armour so that when the devil attacks, and he will, you are ready. So that you are ready to stand your ground, so that instead of buckling when that day comes, you can fight. So what armour has he given us to wear? So first, verse 14 Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled about your waist. Well, what good is a belt in a fight? A belt, you might say. Strange one to start with. Well, first of all, in a fight, a belt will help you because your trousers won't fall down. So that's always a good start. But in, in all seriousness, 
It's the belt that holds everything together. It's the foundation upon which we stand, the belt of truth, the truth about Christ, the gospel that God has revealed to us, the good news that Christ has brought about peace between God and man. We must wear it. We must put it on every morning because it holds everything else together. And notice that it also, um, verse 15, it also gives us readiness for our feet. If we are to be ready to go out, then we must surround ourselves with the truth. So that when we hear the devil's lies, when he lies to us, we can see those lies for what they are. So that's the belt of truth. Next then then, we're going to look at the breastplate of righteousness and with it we'll put the helmet of salvation, which you'll see in verse 17. Notice that these are things that God has already given to us. These are things that Christ has already won for us. We are in a war, but remember, remember that the outcome of this war is secure. Victory has been won, death has been defeated, and in Jesus' death on the cross, he both wins for us salvation, he has already saved us, and he gives us his righteousness. He has already given us righteousness, and we are already righteous in God's sight. And there is nothing that Satan can do to change what Jesus has already done. Nothing. Hold firm to that. Wear Jesus' righteousness like a breastplate and his salvation like a helmet. Keep reminding yourself of these things. They are essential. As soon as you start to trust in your righteousness or think that you need to save yourself, then the devil has a foothold. Don't let him. As you remind yourself of the truth, put these on and do not let them slip. So that's the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. What about the shield of faith then? Can you see that? The shield of faith in verse 16, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, maybe you're like me, and you feel like your faith is wavering. It's unsure. It's too small. It often feels like my faith wouldn't extinguish a delight, let alone flaming arrows from the evil one. But just like with righteousness and salvation, faith isn't something that comes from us and what we've done or what we can do, but faith is a gift from God, given to us by grace. And it's not the strength of my faith willing myself on to trust God, but instead, it's the power from my faith comes from who I put my faith in. Who I put my faith in. If I try to fight Satan myself, say, hold on God, I've got this, don't worry, his flaming arrows will strike home. If we try and exclude God from our battles, then we stand no chance. Instead, trust the fight to God's all-powerful hand who can snuff out even the most powerful of Satan's attacks. Maybe you're tempted to say, well, I'll let God into all of these areas of my life, but not that one. That's my own personal battle. Not that sin. I need to fix that one on my own. But don't. Put it in the hands of God, who is faithful to us. Stand firm in his strength. Pick up the shield of faith. So we've had the shield of faith. Lastly then, um, I think we're on, I think it's on this slide, but probably slightly hidden at the bottom. Lastly then, a weapon. What has God given us to fight with? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He has given us his word. He has revealed himself to us in the Bible. This is his primary weapon against the devil's lies. Do not go without it. 
Do not think that it is an added extra. Take it with you every day. And yes, I guess I do mean, I do mean read it every morning as a quiet time. Do do that, but it's more than that. We are to know the word of God, to take it with us wherever we go, in our hearts. And why do we do that? Well, it's so we are prepared to stand. It's so we are prepared to stand when our colleagues question why we believe what we believe. When the media tell us, oh, don't worry, you just need to love yourself. When the advertisers we tell, it, tell us, oh, you just need this and then you'll be happy. When we are tempted to speak harshly to our brothers and sisters. When we are feeling lazy. The word of God speaks to us in that. And it is powerful. And believe me, I am preaching to myself here. So often, I, instead of picking up the Bible in the morning, I pick up my phone. Instead of when I'm struggling at work, struggling to do work for the Lord, instead of thinking of his word, I'll look at BBC News or BBC Sport and find out the latest results. Instead of doing those things, why am I not encouraging myself with his word? How much easier would the battle be if I was carrying it with me in my heart? So carry the sword of the Spirit with you. These are the clothes that God has given you to wear into battle. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. Make sure you put them on every day. Don't go into battle naked and unprepared. God has given us everything that we need. So point number one, don't be fooled. We are at war. Point number two, so stand firm in God's armour. And lastly, he has also given us each other. We are a unit. Here we are at Grace Church and at home. We are a unit. We are united under Christ to fight under his banner together. And how can we do that best? Well, it's by praying for each other. Verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, Boris says, be alert, fight the virus, save lives. But Paul here says, be alert, pray for each other, save lives. Be alert, pray for each other, save lives. And how much more important is it than defeating coronavirus? And we have all been very active in working together for the good of others by distancing, by washing our hands, by wearing masks. We're all wearing masks today. Why not, every time you wash your hands, pray for God's people? Every time you put on a face mask, pray for your brothers and sisters in your missional communities. Pray that they would stand firm in the full armour of God, even in the day of evil that it talks about in verse 13. And Paul says in verse 19, he says in verse 19, pray for me too. He says, pray for me, so that whenever I speak, I may speak fearlessly about the gospel. Well, we can't pray for Paul, can we? But we can pray for Ben. He sat just over there. We can pray for Ben, and we must pray for Ben. Pray that he stands firm so that he can boldly proclaim the gospel. And I don't mean just like on a Sunday pray, oh, we pray that Ben speaks really well and he uses really good slides. No, I don't mean pray like that. But instead, pray for Ben because he will be under attack. And he will be under attack everywhere. So pray for him at home. Pray for him in his family life. Pray for him in his marriage, in his evangelism, in his pastoral care in his friendships, and of course also in his preaching, pray that he wouldn't be swayed by the devil's lies and be tempted to omit some of God's word or water it down. 
but pray for him that he would proclaim it fearlessly. Pray that in all these things he stands firm in the Lord. And that should be true as we pray for each other too. We don't just pray for each other in our jobs. No, but in the whole of our lives, everything, we must pray for each other so that we can stand firm together. So, do you feel strong? Do you feel strong? Well, if the answer is yes, I do feel strong, then examine your heart. Where is your strength coming from? Is it from yourself? Or are you standing strong in the Lord and the armour that he has given you? If the answer is no, I feel weak, well then be encouraged. He has not called you to battle unequipped. Put on the full armour of God daily and stand in his strength. So don't be fooled, we are at war. So stand together in God's armour as we fight alongside each other. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are strong and that in our weakness you glorify yourself. Thank you that you have given us everything that we need to stand firm for you until we are united with you forever. Please would we be people who put on your armour and stand together. Please give us prayerful hearts that love to build one another up. And please hold on to us, united together in Christ. And as Paul prays in verses 23 and 24, peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen.